department head and director of the Department of Planetary Sciences and the Lunar and Planetary Lab for introducing this screener at the start of the event. I'm honored to be here with you and, um, and to have a chance to meet our experts who will be discussing the U of A's role in the, the Apollo 11 landing and the current lunar research being done here on campus. Uh, this panel is also being live streamed uh, at, at azpm.org. So for those of you joining us at home, thank you and welcome. Uh, now I'll introduce you to our panel. Bill Hartman was a graduate student and later assistant professor in Gerard Kuiper's Lunar and Planetary Lab in the 1960s. During this period, he discovered the moon's giant oriental impact basin and worked out methods to estimate ages of lunar surface features from counts of impact craters. In 1965, he made a correct pre-Apollo prediction of a 3.6 billion year typical age for the lunar lava plains. He co-founded the Planetary Science Institute here in Tucson and is best known for originating the current theory of the origin of the moon along with his PSI colleague, Don Davis. Among various awards, he received the very first Carl Sagan Medal from the American Astronomical Society for communicating science to the public. Uh, off of his bio that I was given to read, he's also an exceptional painter. Uh, I recommend going to his website and checking out some of his, some of his works of art. Yeah. Lynn Carter is an associate professor in the Department of Planetary Sciences and the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. She studies the geology of planetary, planetary surfaces, including volcanism and impact cratering on the moon. She's the deputy principal investigator of the Mini-RF radar instrument on Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and a team member on the Shadow Cam camera on Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> she was part of a team that used the Arecibo Observatory radar system to produce 80 millimeter resolution images of the entire lunar near side. She's also a team member on the radar instruments, on radar instruments headed to Mars and Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, and I also hear she makes a mean prickly pear lemonade. <laughs> Jason Davis. Uh, is a digital, editor, a digital editor at the Planetary Society. He writes about the world's space exploration missions and the Society's science and technology projects, including LightSail. Davis holds a master's degree from the journalism school at the University of Arizona, and he specialized there in science writing and digital publications. He was a NASA Space Grant Graduate Fellow and produced a 35-minute documentary film called Desert Moon, which you can watch at azpm.org. Uh, and that film is narrated by a astronaut, Mark, former astronaut Mark Kelly. He's a contributor for NBC News Mac, Match? Mock. Mock. There you go. Uh, and has served as an adjunct professor at the University of Arizona School of Journalism. Davis began writing for the Planetary Society in 2011, and he lives here in Tucson. I hear he also knows more about the history of the LPL lab than uh, Dr. Swindle. <laughs> Thank you, all of our panelists, for being here and participating in tonight's Q&A. Just to give you all an idea of how this is gonna go, I will ask some of my questions, and then I will open the floor up for you guys to ask your own. Uh, my colleague, Veronica, will run around and uh, give you a microphone. So I wanted to start with you, Dr. Hartman. You were, of course, uh, a member of the team that played a very instrumental role in getting Apollo 11 to the moon. You were here at the U of A. Um, can you just give us a sort of brief recap of what those contributions were? And as someone who, who was working on the project, Sort of how did you feel uh, the day, you know, the crew, the crew reached the moon? Um, Kuiper had come in 1960. I came in 61 as a graduate student in the spring. Kuiper had um, accumulated the very best photographs of the moon from Earth-based telescopes. And even in Chicago, before he got here, he had published a first atlas of all of those photographs. 
he wanted to continue several other atlases, and I was assigned to something called the Rectified Lunar Atlas. And the idea was to photograph features on the moon as seen from overhead. Now, you have to remember, the moon keeps one side toward the Earth, right? So we, you can see this side. And you may see a funny looking feature over here or over here, and you can't quite tell what it is because you're seeing it from that direction. But the idea that Kuiper used, uh, and he was the first one to really exploit this idea, was to project those pictures onto a globe. So now there is a picture of the moon on a globe, and young Bill, that's me, has a big four by five camera, and I'm supposed to be going around and photographing things from different directions. So uh, the, the, the thing that Vanessa mentioned was that one day we had a photograph on the globe, and I came around, and this little group of irregular mountains that had been mapped on this side, when I looked at it from directly straight on, was a beautiful bullseye ring of mountain arcs that formed the rims of a huge impact basin. And I quick made some prints of those and took them to Kuiper, and he graciously let me be the first author on a discovery paper of this very large feature on the moon, which was exciting and interesting because you know, everybody was trying to figure out the smallest scale features, what would it be like to land, and here we could back away from the moon and discover something very large. Um, and Arizona has its fingerprints all over the Apollo missions because those looking straight down photographs were part of what were used in Flagstaff by the, the United States Geological Survey, which created a, an astrogeology group. And they were doing big geologic maps with more detail and latitude and longitude lines, coordinate systems, so that the astronauts could be <laughs> told, OK, this is where you're supposed to land. So there was a lot of interesting stuff going on at that time. And how did you feel? watching. Oh this. gosh, you know, I would come out of the lab in those days. I was working in the dark room, it was nice 68 degrees, so it actually felt good to come out to the 100 <laughs> degree temperature, but I'd look up and there's the moon, and I would think, gee, that's, that's only going to go around the Earth 20 more times, 15 more times, 10 more times before we actually try to get there. So there's a real sense that we were working on something of a kind of global importance and international importance. Lots of fun, great, great time to be here. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one thing that the, this documentary really does a good job at showing is sort of what a tremendous spectacle, it, you know, it, uh, the, the, entire, the entire journey was. Um, Dr. Carter, I wanted to ask you, what did we actually learn from a scientific perspective? What did we actually learn from that first Apollo mission? Was there sort of scientific merit to it, or was it really, you know, a case of beating the Russians to the moon uh, and 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 this tremendous spectacle? No, there was a lot of thought going into those missions as to what could be done scientifically, and the first and most obvious thing was to bring back some samples because then you had rocks, and people like Tim could use different techniques of dating, radiometric techniques, but there's several different systems, argon-related system or rubidium-related system, uranium, all these radiomet radioactive elements that decay can give you an age. And so it was uh, quite, you know, everybody was holding their breath to find out what the age of these rocks would be and the composition. Uh, one of the things that was intriguing was that the the isotopic chemistry of those rocks was, was similar to the Earth. And uh, as you mentioned, my friend Don Davis and I here in, in Tucson at our Planetary Science Institute, which we had created after we got our degrees, um, came up with an idea of the origin of the moon, which was that as the planets formed, and think of the planets forming from asteroid-like bodies coming in and accumulating. The planets were aggregating out of these small things. Well, these small things themselves were growing, and so the question was how big could the 
second biggest one get and the third biggest one in our, in our region of the solar system. And our idea was that the Earth got hit by a very large object and blew blue material, rocky material off the outer part of the Earth and that that's the debris from which the moon formed. And that's by some miracle still the major uh, idea. And lots of people have been making models, computer-based models of that sort of collision. So there was a lot of spin-off from the samples that we first brought back. And Lynn, you, um, you work on the moon. You use radar to look under the, the surface of the moon, I, I believe. Can you tell us uh, some of the most exciting discoveries that you've made? Um, sure. So I like to use radars. Um, and the great thing about radars is that they're this long wavelength. And so they actually, uh, the waves penetrate into the surface. And the reflection that comes back from that can actually show us things that are in the subsurface of the moon. Um, and you know, even watching that documentary, you can tell the moon is covered in dust. Um, and so if you look at optical images, they're very smoothed over, very dusty. Um, but radar will just blow through that dust and you can image things that are underground. And so like my favorite things that we've done are discover things that we didn't know were there um, that are hidden under the surface. So for example, um, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the mini RF radar on there, was actually able to see melts from impacts, like melted rock that was thrown out when something hit the moon um, and then flowed over the lunar surface around craters and you know, into depressions. And if you look in optical images, sometimes there's no evidence that, there's, that that's there, but in the radar, it just like lights up and you can see things that are underground. Um, and we've been able to see like ancient lava flows under the dust too. Um, and so for me, that's the, the most fun thing is being able to see the past of the moon kind of like buried in the stratigraphy with the radar data. And Jason, your documentary, uh, Desert Moon, outlines the role that the U of A played, of course, in, in the 1960s and in, in the, the sort of lead up to the launch of Apollo 11. What was going on here in the 60s? Besides sort of Kuiper's arrival at the U of A, what was going on here that made uh, it such a hotbed of, of astronomy? Yeah, the major thing that was going on at the Southwest at the time was that uh, Kitt Peak was under construction. Um, you know, Kuiper at the time was, as Bill mentioned, still up in Chicago at Yerkes uh, Observatory. And um, he, he didn't quite fit in uh, with some of the traditional astronomers there. Um, so Kuiper was really interested in planetary objects and objects we see in the solar system like the moon. Um, he did some work on uh, Titan, one of Saturn's moons. Um, he discovered uh, a moon around Uranus. So he was looking at all these nearby objects. Uh, in the meantime, he was kind of surrounded by this professional astronomy community that was interested in farther away objects. And actually the same year Kuiper got his degree over in Holland, where he came from originally, um, was the same year that Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe, um, that these, these things we now know are galaxies, were actually very far away and outside of our own, um, our own Milky Way galaxy. So he didn't quite uh, fit in with that traditional community. And um, at the same time, uh, Wisconsin was not a great place for uh, observing. Um, and in the meantime, all this astronomy was starting to, to, to shape in the southwest and Kitt Peak going in. And so he was, um, as several of the people in the documentary told me, he was just very good at finding the right opportunity at the right time and kind of sniffing out these, um, these opportunities. And at the same time, you know, the, a lot of money started pouring in for what would become the space race. And Kuiper knew there was going to be a lot of funding in that. And so everything just kind of clicked together. He came out here uh, to the University of Arizona and met with them a couple times. And they were happy to accept somebody of his stature and let him come and kind of start his own uh, program out here. And that's what became the, the Lunar and Planetary Lab. And what was it about the, that subject that, that got you excited, that made you want to, to make a film about it? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, there, are, there were just so many stories um, from the participants like, like Bill who were, were here and were, saw some of that firsthand. Um, I was surprised once I started looking into it and doing the research about how many um, aspects the university did play in the space race. Um, you know, with the mapping and the lunar atlases was obviously a huge part of it. But then there was the whole um, series of robotic missions that NASA sent to the moon ahead of Apollo, or the Ranger space probes, the surveyors, and the lunar orbiters. And the UA had a hand, um, especially in the Ranger and surveyor probes, 
had a major part in that. And um, you know, as I started learning more about it, and I hadn't realized so many of the people were here. And at the same time, uh, what Kuiper started here at LPL, starting this kind of cross-disciplinary way to look at our own solar system, because he realized you, you know you can't just be an astronomer if you want to study the moon. You have to know geology, and you have to know all these other different subjects. And so it was really kind of the start of this whole new field that we now know as planetary science, really that kind of started here. So it was really fascinating as I started learning more about it. Um, Lynn, of course, we know a lot more today than we did in 1969 about, about the moon. Um, but I'm sure many, many mysteries still remain. What would you say are some of the, the biggest questions still out there about, about the moon? Um, well, there's so many things, both big and small scale, that we don't know about the moon. Um, you know, I, th I think one of them is, you know, about what, what the actual chronology of the lunar surface was. Um, and I know that's, that's a, a field that Bill works in a lot. And, um, you know, we do have the samples, which helps us date that. But, you know, a better understanding of when did all this volcanism that we see on the moon happen and how long did that extend? Um, and that tells us something about how the moon might have evolved. Um, and there's even some like personal favorite things that I really think are cool. And one of those is um, we've seen some examples of little ponds on the moon. Um, little, they look like melts, um, and they're really kind of flat, so it's kind of weird. And one of them is on the exact opposite side of the moon is the Tycho impact. So Tycho is a really bright impact you can see on the moon. I'm um, actually just even with your eyes if you go out and look at it. And on the back side of the moon, there's all these ponds. Um, and, and there's a couple of other big craters on the moon where we also see these ponds kind of on the opposite side of the moon. And so I think there's something there that we don't understand about like how impacts happen and how that material, like can it travel to the other side of the moon or did it come from someplace else? Um, there's some places on the moon that have these little, um, they have a different texture at the surface and some people think maybe they might be associated with comet impacts or something where you have more water in the objects they're impacting. So, I mean, it's this huge laboratory, not just for the evolution of the moon, but even for things like how do impacts happen. Um, so it's a lot, a lot of different things I'm really interested in, yeah. One of the interesting things about what she's doing is this idea of seeing below, because when the Apollo missions were being planned, a lot of scientists correctly said there's no erosion on the moon, there's no rain, there's no wind, and all that. So they had the feeling that all the rocks lying around on the surface of the moon would told the whole story of the moon all the way from when the planets formed four and a half billion years ago to the present. And what I think we realize now is that, wait a minute, yes, there is erosion, which is this constant rain of big, middle-sized, and small asteroidal meteorite objects hitting the moon and grinding up what's on the surface. So the rocks that are, that are actually sitting on the surface today, if you put a rock this size on the surface, it'll only last a uh, hundred million years or a few hundred million years, which means that we can't see all the way back to the surface. So what she can see is what's down there below this powdered ground up surface layer. And I think you know, that's kind of a whole new area of lunar understanding of this kind of history of the the uh, grinding up of the lunar surface material. Yeah, and I mean, that, that stratigraphy and understanding how old that was and you know, how those processes occurred, I think, is a really big one, yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Hartman, a, another thing that I think this film points out really well is sort of how, how amped up everyone, I mean, it, this was just such a unifying force in a you know, pretty yeah. divided society in a, different, in a very difficult time. What is it about space exploration that, that excites us all, that unifies us all? Well, I, I, in my mind, I, you know, what got me interested in astronomy when I was a 14 year old was kind of what, what is our whole human relationship to all this other stuff out in the universe? And uh, this was a first chance to you know, make a visit to uh, you know, another, another body and actually be there and bring back material. And of course now, we, as a result of looking at those materials, we realize that some of the impacts have blown rocks off the moon into space and some of those rocks hit the earth and we can now identify them because we know what lunar rocks look like. So we're getting some free samples. The problem is we don't know where they come from on the moon. Could have been any place, right? And uh, having got that far, we also have a handful of meteorite types that were blown off Mars. 
So we're beginning to understand that we actually have samples from some of the other planetary bodies. And the, the rest of the meteorites, the big majority of them are pieces of asteroids, which are even further just beyond Mars, and that's where most of those come from. Um, Jason, coming back to you, only a handful of, of people were really seriously studying the moon in the early 60s when, when JFK made his announcement that, that Americans would walk on the moon by the end of the decade. Um, why was it? Why was it so overlooked? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it was, my impression of it was that uh, it, was, it was old news by then, um, more back to the question of uh, the astronomy part of it where people were, you know, the, the moon's been hanging in the night sky for so long. Um, th th there was a perception that we know all there is to know about it, um, that we can know by sit standing here on Earth and looking at it. To, you know, to know more, we're, we're going to need to send space probes there or we're going to need to go there physically um, on the surface. So, so yeah, I, I think that really kind of, uh, it, it wasn't quite the, the area of emphasis for astronomy at the time, and only a few people were, starting, were really studying it seriously. When I got here, there was a joke among astronomers that the moon was this really annoying object because they would go up to the mountain and look through telescopes at very faint galaxies and faint stars, and when the moon was in the sky, it lit up the sky too much. So, so you couldn't do your work when the moon was around. <laughs> Why don't we just get rid of the moon? <laughs> yeah, one of the main uh, uh, scientists in uh, Desert Moon, uh, Ewan Whitaker, who had a lot to do with the early Lunar and Planetary Lab story, he uh, actually started working at Greenwich Observatory near London uh, because essentially at, when the moon was out in the sky, uh, the astronomers had no use for the telescope. <laughs> and Ewan, on his own, just curious guy said, I'm going to start just taking this unused telescope and um, looking at regions of the moon and, you know, working out the maps. And I mean, he was very interested in, you know, looking at the maps of the day and seeing if he could improve on them. And that's how he ended up meeting Kuiper. Uh, so, yeah, very much so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly a popular object at the time. There was a third atlas in that series that Kuiper did, which was entirely, I think it was called the orthographic atlas, but there were two guys, Ewan and another guy, David, David Arthur, who were experts in mapping, and they constructed a map with the most detailed and accurate uh, latitude-longitude grid, which was important in, as I said, the U.S. Geological Survey, but also the Apollo landing planning. You had to know where you were, what, what were the latitude and longitude numbers where you actually wanted to set this thing down. And yet still they missed it. They overshot, yeah, that's right. I mean, they, uh, I, I don't know how the, there's something about the ignition when they ignited and then they went a little too far too fast and then he had to uh, uh, figure out, you know, <laughs> watching where were they gonna put, the, <laughs> put it down. And that's why he hovered for a while. And I remember that. I mean, they were counting down the number of seconds left, and he's still hovering up there. And it was, well, you only got five seconds of fuel left. But apparently, it, <laughs> I just read recently, it was a gentle enough landing that they didn't actually feel it hit the ground hard. It was, I mean, he set it down beautifully. Amazing. Um, my last question, and then I'll give you guys an, an opportunity. Uh, before the screening, when we were chatting, when you mentioned that your students, um, you know, don't sort of understand how in the 60s we were able to send people to the moon with such rudimentary technology and and you know haven't in the last few decades uh, what do you tell them and you know will we be returning to the moon anytime soon um well, you know, usually I tell them that, you know, there's always a lot of really smart people, and this was something that we figured out originally, and we could go back if we want. It's expensive, um, and, you know, usually I point out the difference in how much we spent in the space program when we were going to the moon versus how much we spent now. Um, but at the same time, I am hopeful that we'll go back. I think it is kind of a stepping stone if we want to go anyplace else, just to remind ourselves, you know, how to travel in space. I think long duration space, we have to understand how to deal with radiation events. Uh, Apollo is very short. If we want to be in space for a long time, um, you know, we need to work some of those things out, how to protect astronauts. 
Um, so I talked to my students about the fact that I think this is going to happen again, and, and it will probably be you know, an international thing because you need those resources to be able to do it. Um, and it'll look totally different because we do have this better technology. So people talk about Wi-Fi enabled rovers, things automated, driving by themselves, um, video coverage and stuff. So I think it would be really exciting. Yeah. All right. Who has a question? Uh, just she'll give you the mic, and then I'm actually going to repeat your question so our web viewers can hear it too. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm just curious, would any of you three, would you like to go to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question for our panel is if any of them would go to the moon, if they would like to. I feel like I'm old enough that if I went through all the training, there wouldn't be anything left of me. So, <laughs> so, so I'm going I'm to stay and work on it from here. Um, I mean, I'd, lo I'd love to go if it was easy. I would definitely say yes, and I, I know what questions I want to answer, and also exactly where I want to go. Um, but I also love robotic exploration, and uh, yeah, there's the astronaut training is like, uh, you know, difficult, and I like the robots enough that um, I haven't wanted to join the astronaut program. Yeah, I would go only after a lot more people had gone first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. In a word or two, what does a digital editor do? Uh, so well, let me just repeat yeah, the question ahead. for our online viewers. Uh, the question to Jason was, in a word or two, what does a digital editor do? Uh, yeah, it's the same uh, as an editor at a, any news organization, um, except I just do it digitally, uh, meaning we're all online. There's no print version or anything like that, just our website. How much of a problem, uh, if we were to travel to the moon, uh, would space debris be today versus earlier? OK, the question is, how much of a problem, if we were to go back to the moon, would, I don't know where that's going, would space debris pose as opposed to, in the, in, say, in the 1960s? Anyone? <laughs> There's a lot of debris up yeah. there. I mean, the chance of actually hitting something on the way would be I think minuscule, but that's a growing problem. Right, especially with all these tiny little satellites that everyone wants to launch. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it would be any more challenging, uh, you know, any more dangerous than it was then right now. Um, but there are more objects; they just have to be tracked very carefully. Yes, uh, Veronica, we have a question here. I was wondering about the astronauts being quarantined when they come back from space. And you know so much about it now, maybe they wouldn't have to be because you've studied the moon anyway. But what was the idea behind that? That they would bring things back that would endanger man or that they might be injured themselves? So the question was, why? what was the reasoning be behind quarantining astronauts when they return from space? Yeah, it was uh, it was mainly so they wouldn't if they brought something back, it wouldn't you know go any further beyond them. Uh, so they just to kind of explain it a little further, they immediately upon returning to the ship, the uh, Navy ship out in the middle of the ocean, they moved into the little mobile quarantine facility. It was essentially like a little airstream trailer, and they transported that all the way back to Houston and kept them in quarantine for a couple weeks. Um, just on the off chance that there was some unknown pathogen in the lunar soil that we had not been able to detect. Um, it was very unlikely, but they did that for the first, I believe, two or three missions, and then finally stopped doing it because they determined there was no risk of anything like that. It hadn't been known how much transfer there is from one planet to another, but there were ideas about that. And now, we, as I mentioned, we know that rocks you know, make it from Mars to here. So, I mean, you... You could imagine that if life had evolved on Mars at some time and somehow some of that material was still sitting there on the moon, you know, maybe there could be all kinds of nasty molecular <laughs> structures that could cause all kinds of problems. So they were being extra safe. And we have a question back there. Thank you. This is just curiosity. We know that they were almost out of fuel as they were landing. 
would they have been able to ignite the rockets that took them back up if they were getting ready to crash? <coughs> So the question is about um, the running low on fuel and whether or not they would have been able to ignite uh, the the rockets in order to return. So I believe that was the action, that was the abort scenario. If they didn't land, they needed to essentially because the the lunar module had a descent stage and an ascent stage, and after they landed on the moon using the descent stage, it stayed on the surface and they blasted off using the ascent module. Um, it was possible, in fact, they tested this in Earth orbit to hot, it was called like some kind of a hot stage or hot separation where they were still together and they blasted off in the ascent module. So that was one of their abort methods as they were getting close to the surface. If they had to abort, they could pop off in the ascent module. Um, as far as doing it that close to the surface, if they're, I'm, I'm not sure what the cutoff was because they had momentum carrying them into the surface. I don't know what the exact cutoff point was. Any more questions? Oh, here we go. Hi. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the next trip to the moon will probably be an international uh, exploration. I'm wondering what the role of private companies in human exploration is, and how does that change the public's opinion and view of the moon, and who owns the moon, and, and will it ever be I'm going to paraphrase that. Uh, the question is about the role of um, private space exploration companies in sort of the next phase of um, space exploration. I'm, I'm actually fairly concerned about that, particularly with uh, asteroids, because it's, we now know there are asteroids that are easier to get to and come back from than, than the moon, because you don't have to, you, you, moon, you have to take off again against the gravity of the moon. Asteroids are so small, you can just kind of park next to them and then come back. So there are issues about that. Uh, another aspect is that I think that planetary science in general is a wonderful demonstration project for international collaboration. And I think all of us have the experience of working with scientists from other countries. I've worked with lots of Russian scientists. And it's really impressive, you know, how much the scientists want to work with each other. And, uh, you know, we have problems now of, of uh, sort of driving the two countries apart at the top levels <laughs> when all the scientists would love the opportunity to keep working together. I'll tell one anecdote. Briefly, I was working on a project where we worked with some Russian scientists. We were at a place outside of Moscow. And after about the third day, we all had a big Russian dinner together and a big table. There's vodka and Pepsi and vodka and Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was a young guy across from me. And after he a couple of vodkas, you know, he was saying, well, two years ago, I was working on what went in the top of rockets at that time, and all of those rockets were aimed at you people. And he paused for a minute and said, I would much rather be doing this, sending, sending something to Mars. And I thought, gee, that's, there's the whole problem in a, in a nutshell. You know, how, do we, how do we get ourselves actually doing things like that together? The problems are geo geopolitical, not technical. Um. That basically brings us to the end of tonight's event. I do actually have one more question that I want to pose to you, and I think it's a you you gave me a nice segue. Um, so, you know, the moon landing was really an example of a nation coming together to achieve something truly, you know, monumental and transformative. What should the next great goal for for this country or for the world be? And it can be, you know, from a science a, a, astronomy perspective or otherwise. Go. go ahead. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for me, uh, like, I would love to see us go to Mars, but I think I have to answer this as climate change. I think this is the great worldwide problem, is how do we make sure um, that we don't boil our planet um, and that it's going to affect some people in different ways. I mean, that's a geopolitical problem. It's an engineering problem. It's a science problem and understanding, you know, what's even going to happen. And so I think um, that's kind of what I think of as the next big global problem. Yeah, I think that's certainly right. Um, 
And the, what we've learned about other planets is something that's helped us to understand what's happening to our planet. Venus, for example, has this very thick CO2 atmosphere. And if it had an atmosphere like us, it would temperature would be something like 140 degrees average Fahrenheit because it's closer to the sun. But it's, it's actually 700, 900 degrees uh, on Venus because of this atmosphere. And uh, so we, you know, we think we understand something about why that happens. Yeah, climate change aside, um, I would agree that's the, the higher priority than space exploration. If we're just talking about pure space exploration and the next goals and the next steps, um, I think going back to the moon is a terrific place to start. Um, you know, we were talking about going straight to Mars, but you know, I think the moon is a good logical next step, even though they're very different places. The moon and Mars are, you know, very different places to land humans and live and work. Um, but yeah, I think there's you know something inspirational to be inspirational to be said for human spaceflight, even though um, doing things like sending robots uh, return a lot of <laughs> amazing science. And you know, I never want to see robotic exploration sacrificed in favor of human exploration. But uh, astronauts hold this kind of mythical place in our society. So um, you know, I think going back to the moon is a is a worthy destination. Interesting tie-in between these two <laughs> subjects because. Uh, there's a very well-known guy here in town, Roger Angel, in the Optical Sciences Department, and he's one of those who has published on the idea of, and there's been engineering studies on this, putting material at a stable point between the Earth and the Sun. It's called the L1, it's a Lagrangian point. And it doesn't take much to keep material there. And so there have been people actually looking at the engineering of putting enough material there, if you can block one or two or three percent of the sun's radiation, it wouldn't even be visible from the earth, but you could put a, a number of small objects is the best way to do it. Uh, you, could, you could reduce the solar input into the earth and bring the temperature back down without doing anything to disturb the environmental situation on the earth. I mean, there's other di ideas about pumping stuff into the atmosphere, but you know, what if, what if something goes wrong with that? <laughs> but this would be easy to put in place or take away if you had to do it. So like there are some tie-ins. I feel like there's a tie-in with Apollo, too, in that there's this famous Earthrise photo, right, where you see the lunar surface and the Earth rising above it. And like a lot of those photos from Apollo, I think, were like kind of how the climate movement and the Pivotal, environmental right. in movement really started because, you know, we can finally see that we also live on a planet. Because it was just after those first missions that the idea of Earth Day and, and I mean, the idea of seeing the Earth as a finite globe, you know, gosh, you know, we're all in it together. <laughs> whatever, whatever our ideologies are, we're all in it together. Yeah, and that came across to people. Yeah, it's ironic that we went all the way to the moon and then what really stood out was seeing Earth yeah. from uh, the distance, you know. Uh, bringing it back to private space exploration, you know, a lot of people want to go and uh, live permanently on Mars and set up a whole new society there, terraform the planet, but <laughs> Earth is my favorite planet. I, I love it here, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm happy to stay here, yeah. Uh, well, thank you all for, for being with us tonight, Dr. Hartman, Dr. Carter, and Jason. I was asked to just remind you all again that this is the first in a series of many events being hosted by University of Arizona departments and community partners to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. The full list of Moonfest events can be found. I actually have two different websites for you, so take your pick. One of them I have is flandro.org uh, backslash Apollo. And then the other one, which was mentioned earlier, is moonfest.arizona.edu. It's the same page. There you go. <laughs> Technology. Uh, please tune into the, to the three-part series, Chasing the Moon, on PBS 6. It airs on part one airs on July 8th at 8 p.m. Thank you again to the Flandro Science Center for having us and to our live stream viewers. Thanks so much. Have a good night. And thanks to Vanessa. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>